Good morning. Okay, great. I'm without a podium and people are worried that I'm going to fall off the stage or something, so it's on its way. Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Redemption Hill Church. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16, continuing our series in the book of Acts. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there are, uh, we do have a stack of them on the back table there, a stack of paperback Bibles. Uh, if you don't own, own a Bible, that would be our gift to you. We'd love for you to take that home uh, and take that with you. So Acts chapter 16, very exciting chapter today. I hope that you've been enjoying this, uh, this study through the book of Acts. I have been in- enjoying this study through the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. It's very exciting. Theology in action. We have mass conversions. You have people, people being raised from the dead. And it continues today. I've titled the sermon today, Exorcisms, Earthquakes, and Evangelism. Hope that has your attention. Well, please join me in prayer uh, right after we get this, uh, this podium in place here. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Thanks, guys. All right, please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts, grateful for your word, grateful for your grace, grateful for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of oppor- for the opportunity to sing together this morning and to be together as the church, encouraging one another, challenging one another, lifting one another up, and pointing one another to you, Father. What a gift it is. And Father, we pray now that you would help us. We need you, Father. We love you. We pray that you would stir up our affections, Lord, that you would remind us of how you have rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, empower us by the Holy Spirit for the work that you've called us to, for the glory of your name. I pray now that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Acts chapter 16, uh, we're going to start, pick it up in verse 16 and follow, uh, read through to the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and, and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that her hope, their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with the entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, These magistrates have sent to you to let, to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. 
And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as I teach my kids how to read the Bible, I always want to help them understand that there are right ways to read the Bible. There are wrong ways to read the Bible. One of the wrong ways to read the Bible is to read it without your imagination. Now, reading without your imagination, by this I mean simply like to sit down, to read your Bible, to close your Bible, to say that was interesting, and to go about your day. This is no different really from reading your newspaper. You just read it for information, and that's it. When I say we should use our imaginations, what I mean is not to uh, insert things into the text, not to, uh, not to imagine something that's not there, because that would be called heresy. Rather, what we want to do is to put ourselves into the text. We want to read in such a way that we feel it, that we see it, that we, that we let, let it shape us in how we understand who God is and therefore who we are what is true about God, and what is true about us. We want that to affect us and to stir us and to strengthen our faith. That's the effect that this passage should have on us. I want us to see it and to feel it. I want us to be shaped by it. I want it to strengthen our faith. In this passage, we read about the unstoppable power of the gospel, bearing bearing through social, ethnic, and economic barriers. We see this in different conversion stories, and each one is unique. They're not ju- it's not just a, a string of conversion stories, and each one is just, let's add one more, let's add one more. No, each one of them is unique. And in this process, I think that we will learn some things about God. I think that we will learn some things about ourselves. And more than that, I am praying that God stirs our affections afresh for the grace that we've received, and that through that, he will strengthen us for the work that he has called us to do. So three conversion stories this morning. Uh, I'm actually going to cheat and go back a little bit to last week's passage and look at Lydia for just a few minutes. My three points are simply the gospel for the religious, the gospel for the oppressed, and the gospel for the secular. So first of all, the gospel for the religious. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because John preached a wonderfully helpful sermon last week on this passage. So I don't want to dwell on it long, but it's important for our context to see the contrast and the comparison between these three conversion stories. So here's what we know about Lydia. We know that Lydia is a religious woman. We know that she is a moral woman. She has done very well for herself in the marketplace. She appears to be a wealthy woman. She's from Thyatira, which is a massive port city in the ancient world, and she is in Philippi. So this would be like New York or London, maybe Hong Kong, cities that shape the economic force of the world that we live in. So they're important cities. She has a house in both of these cities, so you can understand that she has done well for herself. That's the, that's the impression that we have of Lydia. We know she's religious. She's rejected Roman paganism, and on the, on the Sabbath here, she, we find her, Paul comes upon her, and she's basically doing the equivalent of a Bible study uh, there along the bank. So Paul begins to speak, and it says that Lydia's eyes were opened. Her heart is open. She hears Paul, and she is baptized as she places her faith in the gospel that he proclaims. So what you have here is a wealthy businesswoman, extremely successful, moral, religious, at church, but is not necessarily a follower of Christ. She's morally upright, involved in the church, but she hasn't quite yet committed herself to Christianity. And then Paul comes along. God steps in, sovereignly saves this woman. And such were some of us. Many of us in the room can identify with this kind of a conversion story. Many of us can understand growing up in a religious home, growing up with a moral home, a, you know, maybe a conservative home, whatever it is, according to the world's standards, good and decent people. And then we hear the gospel proclaimed at some point and place our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a glorious, miraculous story of sovereign grace at work in our lives. That's not my testimony, but I know it's some of yours. I know many of us, many of us have that testimony, and many of us know people like that. Many of us right now, people are coming to mind, names are coming to mind, people in our community, people that we know, friends of ours, maybe family members that live there now. They would define themselves as Christians maybe, but maybe there's no fruit in their life. Maybe they would testify that they're actually followers of Christ, but you look at them, you see them, and you just see disconnects. You say, okay, you say you believe that, but I don't see that played out in your life here. And so we pray for them, and we minister to them, and we want God to work in them. So John preached a fantastic message on that sermon last week that I want to commend it to you if you missed. 
But just hold that in your mind, the gospel for the religious. Now, our passage this morning, the gospel for the oppressed. The next woman that we look at has nothing in common with Lydia. Nothing in common. So you read, and Paul and Silas are going through. They're going to the house of prayer. So they're going along. There's probably no synagogue uh, there in Philippi at the time. And so they're going to the place of prayer. And they're met by this slave girl. They're met by this girl who is demon-possessed. We read, she comes along. She had brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She follows along, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She does this for many days, the text says. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turns and says to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And her owners saw that their hope of, of gain is gone. They become aggravated, agitated with them, and they drag Paul and Silas into the marketplace before the rulers. So this is, it's kind of confusing text because this girl is demon-possessed, and yet she's going along saying, you know, she's coming along saying, yeah, that guy is saying the truth. That guy is preaching the Most High God. And you think, okay, well, is that a bad thing that this, that this girl is doing this? She seems to be attesting to the veracity of what they're preaching, but actually what she's doing is mocking them. She's not trying to support them, but to distract from them. Because of who she is, people would have connected what she was saying, and they would have been very confused by this. They wouldn't have understood that, they were, that she was speaking about the one true God. She was using a generic term, the Most High God, which you could have attributed to any number of the deities uh, that were believed in in the day. And so Paul fed, gets fed up with it, and he just turns to her. He, the Bible says he gets annoyed with her, which I can understand he turns around and casts out the demon, and away it goes. He, th- we see an exorcism. The only exp- you know, the, we see this exorcism in the New Testament, which is an exciting moment, because you don't see that very often. Now, the demon is sent out, but I think in this moment that she is converted. I think that the slave girl is converted, which is not obvious from the text explicitly. It's not explicitly said that she places her faith in the Lord Jesus. It doesn't say that she's baptized like it does Lydia or the Philippian jailer. But here's why I believe that she is converted in this moment. First of all, her story is right in the middle of of three conversion stories. Okay, so there's continuity here that we're supposed to pick up. In addition to that, uh, in addition to that, it says um, in Matthew 12, here's what happens in Matthew 12. You don't have to turn here, uh, but we'll put it up on the screen. Here's what happens in Matthew 12. Jesus is teaching. He says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in good order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. So here's what, here's what happens. We have Jesus teaching. Here's how the demonic works. If an evil spirit is cast out and something doesn't move into that spirit, into that place, then that evil spirit will not just return, but will return with some friends, right? The person will be worse off after than they were before. Well, this slave girl, her owners realize uh, that after the spirits have been cast out, they can no longer make money. So it's not there anymore. Whatever spirit, whatever demon was in her, Allowing her to be a fortune teller, a diviner, is gone. Okay, so that is, that is gone. So something else has moved into the house. And that's why, that's why I think that this slave girl is now part of the family of God. Okay, so she's right, it's right in the middle of these conversion stories. Now, if I were to ask right now, okay, so some of us could probably identify with Lydia because we grew up in a moral home, a religious home, and we placed our faith at some point in the gospel. But if I asked how many people this morning identify with Lydia, how many people this morning would say, that was me, demon-possessed, I was a fortune teller, I was a slave, and then God saved me? I don't think many hands would go up. You can certainly slip your hand up if you want to and, and tell me. I'd love to hear that story. But my guess is that there are not a lot of former slave girl Uh, diviner, fortune teller, demon-possessed people in the room today. Maybe there are, but here's the heart of the issue. Either by her own steps or by the force of others, here's where we can identify with this slave girl. This is a girl who has given herself over to to a lifestyle of sin and depravity that has now consumed her life. This girl's story, I love that this girl's story is right after Lydia's because they're so different. 
Okay, if we look at the different types of people that God saves, they're not, it's not one stereotype. It's not one type of person. There's not one personality that God saves over and over and over again. We don't see the room. This room isn't filled with the same story over and over again. It is the same story in the sense that we're all stories. We all share the same story of sovereign grace. However, all of our stories look very different. We all came from different places. And so the fact that this girl's story is right after Lydia's is so important because it gives so many of us hope. It gives us hope for ourselves. It gives us hope for our neighbors because we all know people like this. Lydia is put together. She's driven. She's brilliant. She's savvy. She's, she's successful. She's wealthy. She's well-respected. Jesus steps right into her place and saves her. And then right after that, it's this girl, completely messed up taken advantage of, abused, given herself over to a lifestyle of sin that consumes her. Jesus steps into her world, and he saves her. Some of us have no way to, re to relate to Lydia. We look at Lydia. Some of us this morning would look at Lydia and say, that's nice. That's nice that there are some people who grow up, and they're just nice people, but that's not me. And some of us can identify with this slave girl. Some of us know what it's like to grow up in a, in a home that's not religious, in a home that's messed up, in a home where there, there's just fights and vitriol and anger and, and just sin all over the place. For some of us, Jesus found us in a dark place like this girl. Jesus found us in the nastiness of drugs and alcohol, a lifestyle of sin that has wreaked ourselves in our world, and, and we are treating, our, treating ourselves cheaply. For some of us, God met us in the middle of just some of the most horrific and dark things that we can imagine. Well, this is what gives us hope about this story. This story gives us hope because if God can save girls like that, God can save people like me, and God can save people like that person in your neighborhood that you wish would move out, that you're constantly thinking, do I need to call the cops because the party's going again, cars are parked all up and down the street, or that person who I've reached out to and every time I do, I find out that they stole something out of my purse or they're taking advantage of me again. God gives us hope for that person too because he saved this girl. By the grace of God, by the blood of the lamb, God rescues the oppressed. God rescues, he saves the unsavable because there are no unsavable in God's world. There is no one who is not able to be saved. And we'll come back to that. But there's another story here that I want us to look at. One more story, the gospel for the secular. So what ends up happening here is that as Paul and Silas, they, there's this exorcism, they cast out this demon. The girl is no longer of any use to, this, uh, to the, her owners. And so the owners are aggravated. They're frustrated because they're wealthy businessmen. I mean, they, are, you know, they are making a lot of money off of their little fortune teller. And now that source of income is gone, so they're aggravated, so they start stirring up the crowd, and they haul Paul and Silas into the city, into the marketplace, right in the center of their life, and they insist that they be punished. And so the rulers decide to put them in jail. They call the jailer. They, they tell the jailer, after they've beaten him, they tell the jailer, keep them safely in prison. So the jailer puts them in prison. But he doesn't just put them in prison. He doesn't simply put them. He takes them to the innermost cell, it says. Now, the innermost cell would have been like the lowest point of the prison. You know, you've got jail all around, and they take them all the way into the innermost part. And it goes downhill back then. These jails, they would have run downhill. And so the waste inside the jail would have run downhill, and it would have collected in the innermost part of that jail. So you can see he wasn't taking them to the nice part of the jail. And not, not only that, but then he puts their feet in stocks, and he chains them to the wall. And the stocks, what we, what we understand here is that there are you know, these contraptions that they put their feet in, and then they could spread their feet apart, making them very uncomfortable. This was not intended primarily or exclusively to keep them safe. It was intended to be uncomfortable. It was to discourage any thought of trying to escape. So he puts them there, and they're incredibly uncomfortable. And we read in verse 27, when the jailer woke, well, let's back up. Verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake, and immediately all the doors were open. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors were open. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. Then verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
And, he call, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, historically speaking, in, ra- in major Roman uh, metropolitan areas like this, the jails were staffed by former soldiers. So this Roman jailer, just to paint a picture of who this guy is, okay, so this is the gospel for the secular. So let's think about who this jailer is for a moment, okay? So this jailer is likely a former Roman soldier. Roman soldiers were not known as nice people. And often as a gift of retirement uh, from the front, they were given these jails to run. So they would retire, and their, re- their retirement plan was basically, here, go run this jail because that's something you can do. You don't have to go out to war anymore, but you can run this jail. You'll do it well. And so they, Roman soldiers were known as a brutal, brutal, tyrannical regime. In fact, historically speaking, I read that there are records of multiple cities that were sacked and destroyed. As a, diff- as a deterrent from any type of rebellion, there are a couple of places in history where we actually read that as many as 20,000 people were crucified, men, women, and children, on the walls or on the roads leading into the city. So as, as you walk into the city, you see these people who are crucified. And you think, if I'm thinking about planning a rebellion, this, this might discourage me a little bit to see how powerful and how savage, how brutal these people are that I'm going in to, to take over. So they're not sweet people. We don't know specifically what this jailer's background is, but that helps paint a little bit of a picture. We don't know what he had been a part of, but historically, men who see hard things up front on war, in war, are part, they, they struggle with that afterwards. They come back from home from battle, and oftentimes they struggle. My stepdad uh, went through, was in Desert Storm in Iraq, and I remember when he came home, he didn't talk about what happened over there. He struggles to this day to talk about what happened over there, especially with people who, who don't know what war is like, because they just, they just say, you just can't imagine how brutal, how terrible this is. And my father, he, his isn't an extreme case. Some people come home, and they're just, they come back aggressive. They're different. They're violent. They can't get their head out of what they've seen or what they've heard. Maybe that's the story of this jailer here. What we know is that it seems that this jailer is marked by a type of bitterness and anger over something that, that happened in his life. And so when he receives the command to put them in jail and to keep them safe, what he does is not just that, but then he tortures them. He puts them in, in very painful, uncomfortable positions in the innermost part of this jail. And yet even into the darkness of this secular soldier's life, Jesus steps in. Even into the life of this man who is oppressing the people of God. And you think of Paul himself. And you think about the irony here of Paul who was once the man who was an oppressor. He was once the guy who gave his assent, who cast his vote to have Christians put to death. And now he's in prison under this other oppressor. And again, God sovereignly steps in. God steps in and he saves. And maybe that's your story. Maybe, maybe that's where you can identify. Maybe you didn't identify with Lydia. Maybe you can't identify with a slave girl, the, the one who grew up in a life of sin. But maybe, maybe you know what it's like to have been angry, bitter. Maybe you grew up and things happened to you early on in life where you participated in things early in life and you didn't want to own it. You didn't want to take any, any credit for that. It wasn't your fault that you did those things. And that caused anger to grow in us. That caused bitterness to grow in us. I get that. And yet God stepped in, in his sovereign grace. And we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And something happened within us where that anger and that bitterness started to dissipate. And God gave us new affections, a new hope, new reason to live, a new joy God keeps stepping into these messy places and saving. He keeps calling out and ransoming people out of them. Not only have we been saved from these places, but there are people we know who are still stuck in these places, don't we? You can think about people you know, people that you uh, you work with or family members, people in your neighborhood that, that as you hear this description, you start to think, I wonder, I wonder if that's Joe. I wonder, I wonder if that's my neighbor, Barbara. You know, that's, that seems to describe her. I seem, I seem to see her face coming to mind here. 
God's ransom and rescue us of us out of these places is helpful because then he sends us as his ambassadors back into those places with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the power of God for salvation. We get to share with other people the same wonderful news, the same glorious story of salvation that we ourselves have received. All the reasons that we sang about earlier, we want to invite our friends in and say, this is true. We have reason to sing. You have reason to sing because you can put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing to watch God save, to watch scales fall from people's eyes, to watch a heart go from dead, from black to new, to watch the dead raised. It's a glorious thing. So Paul and Silas sat in the jail in the, stock, in the stocks with their feet so stretched apart that it was unbearable. And what are they doing? They sat and they prayed and they sang they sang, friends, because they knew that their sovereign God ruled over all things. They were not afraid. They knew they were exactly where they needed to be, and so they did not despair, but they rejoiced in the midst of their suffering. This is a lesson for us to, to what it is to sing. Blessed be your name. That song, friends, that song is it's hard in the midst of suffering. Suffering is real. I remember, I remember the week that my mom died in an accident 10 years ago, 11 years ago. I remember going to church and that song, the church was singing it. And I remember trying to imagine lifting my hands in praise when I was going through the, the deepest grief that I've ever gone through in my life. And yet in time, singing helps. It ministers to our soul. It reminds us of truths. It speaks to our emotions. It speaks to our affections. So Paul and Silas they weren't in there cursing the jailer. They didn't wallow in self-pity, but they worshiped their God who providentially placed them right where they needed to be for the advance of the gospel. And God sends an earthquake. The jailer and others see this as an act of God, which even insurance companies today recognize. Sorry. It's as good as it gets. But what so encourages me with this, guys, is that as we take steps of obedience, as we take steps of, of obedience, trying to step forth, trying to help carry forth, advance the gospel, God is with us. He is with us in power. We see this earthquake. The same God who sent that earthquake is with you and me. If he needs to shake the, or, shake the earth in order to advance the gospel, God will shake the earth. He can do that. He did that then. The same God here is here today. The same God has the same power, and we are never alone. When we're preaching to our neighbors, our coworkers, when we're sharing the gospel with tears in our eyes, appealing to people to believe and appealing to them to leave their lifestyle of sin, that same God is with us here today. We are never alone. He will do whatever is necessary to advance his gospel, and his sovereign plan is to use us, to use you and me. I, I mentioned earlier that our plan for evangelism as the church is the church. That's God's plan. It's not unique to us. We are his ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 says. We are the ambassadors of reconciliation, ambassadors of another kingdom, ambassadors of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to proclaim that well. So they do this. The jailer responds. Well, he doesn't respond as you'd expect. You'd expect with this earthquake, the doors are opened. He rushes in and he, and he sees them there. And he doesn't say, my goodness, you're all still here. This is great. Why didn't you leave? Why are you all still here? What's going through your mind? Instead, the jailer, drawn by the grace of a sovereign God, asked the only question that ultimately mattered. What must I do to be saved? God is at work when people ask questions like that. God is at work. God is drawing this jailer to himself. And Paul answers him in verses 31 and 32. He says, you don't have to do anything. It's been done. You don't have to do anything but place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done it all. This jailer, we don't know what he means by what must I do to be saved. He's probably not do, saying it in like the Christian sense of tell me about salvation. What he means is probably like I have angered a God. He probably doesn't recognize yet that, that there is one God. He probably doesn't understand the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. But in this moment, he's asking, what do I need to do to appease the God who just sent this earthquake? What do I need to do to escape trouble? 
And they say, Jesus has done it for you. He has paid the penalty. He has done all that you need to do to be saved. Believe that he is the Son of God come in the flesh in order to die the death that you deserve because of the penalty of your sin. He has paid that penalty so that your sins could be washed away. Believe and be saved. That was the gospel for the Joe. That was the gospel for the slave girl. That was the gospel for Lydia. That was the gospel for you and me. That's the gospel that we proclaim today is that people don't need to clean themselves up. They don't, they don't need to take steps of penance. They need to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Saved by the grace of a sovereign, merciful, holy, and glorious God is our story. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And the good shepherd came after every one of us. What I love about this story is the one who was mocking God was rescued out of her mockery. One who was filled with bitterness and anger and was pointing that bitterness and anger toward other people. He was venting it out on others because he was so angry. He wanted other people to be angry and bitter with him. He was saved by the grace of God. God, God didn't just light him up for that. How many of you have ever, like me, in a moment of, of, of anger, you've gone out, you're, you're acting like a kid, slamming doors and, and throwing things around the room and wallowing in self-pity, and then God just shines his grace on you in some remarkable way. You step outside, and you just feel the breeze of, a, of, of, of cool air. <laughs> I, deserve, I deserve to be struck down in so many moments of my life, and yet God sends grace. God sends grace. This jailer was going to commit suicide because he had failed in keeping the prisoners in, because he knew that that would be his penalty anyway. We know that when Peter escaped prison, that the jailer was put to death. That would have been his penalty. And so to escape that shame, to escape the, the public humiliation, he's going to end it himself. And yet God doesn't allow that. God tells Paul, stay put. Keep the other prisoners there and speak grace to this man. Share the gospel with this man. God says, no, you're not going to do that. You're mine. I'm going to rescue you. That's our story. God can save anyone. The grace that we've received, that's the grace that we're called to proclaim. The point of these stories, there is no type of person to be, that is predisposed to believe the gospel. There's no one type. Lydia, the slave girl, the secular soldier, they, they represent three different racial classes. They represent three different social classes and economic backgrounds. If you lose hope for anybody, listen, if you lose hope, that God could save anyone, it shows that you don't understand what it is to be a sinner saved by grace. We need to meditate on the gospel. We want to rehearse what it is that God has done in our lives. Remember who we were and who we are. We are sinners saved by grace. And so he can rescue anyone, friends. Amen. There is not a single person you've ever met who is beyond the reach of the gospel. That's your estranged father, your angry atheist neighbor. That's your child who's been walking away from God for so long. God can save anyone, and he delights to do it. So here's some things I want us to walk away with from these stories. Anytime that we engage in personal evangelism, and we are called to engage in personal evangelism, 2 Corinthians 5, ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of reconciliation. Anytime that we take steps of obedience in that, we can expect mockery. And that's, that's probably, probably why we hesitate so often, right? We can expect that there will be a group of people who mock you. Here's what I know. Many people in the world today think that we're a bunch of crazy-headed um, buffoons, crazy people that, that are weak. They think that they're smarter than us. They think that they are dialed in in a way that we never could imagine. So much smarter than us. Okay, we should expect that. It was like that for Paul. It was like that for Peter. It was like that for Jesus himself, to be mocked, to be scorned. Then there's another group of people that says, I'm curious, and I'm willing, I'm willing to talk more about this. I'd like to, why don't we meet again? Okay, you gave me, um, you, you gave me something to think about. Let me, let me go back, and um, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll talk again. I'm an open-minded person. Let's talk again. Maybe this is a little bit different than what I thought it was. I haven't heard it quite like this. They're asking questions. 
They keep coming back. Then, then there's some who say, no, no, I, I am in. I am all the way in with all the zeal that God has given me. I am all the way in for the cause of Christ, for the mission that he has to redeem and reconcile people around the world. Anytime, listen, anytime that we share, anytime that we engage, anytime that we step out in faith and we muster up all the courage we have to, to finally say, hey, can I, can I talk to you about something? Can I share something with you that's, that's really important to me? These are the kinds of responses we can expect. We can expect all three of them. And I think that often, friends, whether we've been mocked to our faces or not, and, and, and we will be at times, I have been, certainly, many times, many of us are unwilling to see these second two happen out of fear of the first one, aren't we? We fear the mockery. We fear, we fear the shame. We feel the fear the, you know, being made fun of so much that we won't risk it to step out in the hope that maybe God will save this person. We don't want to be looked at as foolish. We don't like being in uncomfortable places. I'm introverted. I like being with my books by myself. Don't tell me to go talk to somebody. That's for radical Christians. That's for the Paul and Silas's in the church. Go ahead Mr. Spurgeon, I'm just going to sit over here and mind my own business and live my quiet life. Regardless of the souls that are on the line, regardless of those who are broken and lost all around us, I don't want to be, I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be mocked. That, that would be worse than anything in the world. And then we stay quiet and we rob ourselves. We rob ourselves of the joy of watching the most incredible, miraculous, glorious work in all of the world watching a man be raised from the dead. Help us, God. <laughs> this is me. This is where I live. I'm preaching to myself here. Earlier, some have said, maybe I can identify with Lydia or, or this slave girl. Maybe I can identify with this secular soldier. Here's what I believe. I earnestly believe that God has placed us those of us who have been saved by the sovereign grace of God, those of us who have received the glorious news of the gospel, I earnestly believe that God has put us here in order to engage those people in the community all around us. Ricky Ramos shared, was teaching on prayer earlier this morning, and he shared from Matthew 5, where Jesus is teaching at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we want to do. We want to take this and share it with others, desperately, eagerly, full of faith. The next chapter of Acts, Luke says, God might seek them and find them, for he is not far from any of us. That's why you're here today. So why don't we... Pray and ask God for courage. Ask God for grace. Ask God to make these things clear to us. Ask God to give us such faith and joy and hope of getting to lead someone to salvation. And look around and apologize to those who we haven't shared with yet. Because we all have those family members or coworkers or friends or neighbors that we have been building relationships with and we've been looking for that opportunity. It's been years. Maybe we should just, maybe we should go and, and just apologize and say, look, I don't know. I should have done this years ago. I don't know why I didn't. I was just dumb, embarrassed. But this is important to me, and I think it's going to be important to you. Can we talk about something? Can we sit down together? I want to share something with you. It's the most important thing in my life. And then step out in faith. Risk being mocked and pray and hope that God will open eyes. Ask God to do the miraculous and raise from the dead. Share with them the most glorious news that they'll ever hear. Well, for those of us like me who struggle with feelings of inadequacy when it comes to this, I want to close with this. The famous British preacher of the 19th century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once shared a story to his church. He was supposed to speak at a, another church in the area, and he was taking the train, 
and something happened, and the train never runs behind, but it was running behind. And so he was running significantly behind. And so it happened, he says, that I reached the appointed place considerably behind the time. Like sensible people, I love this, like sensible people, they had begun their worship, and they had proceeded as far as the sermon. As I neared the chapel, I perceived that someone was in the pulpit preaching. And who should the preacher be but my dear and venerable grandfather? He saw me as I came in at the front door and made my way up the aisle. And at once he said, here comes my grandson. He may preach the gospel better than I can, but he cannot preach a better gospel. Friends, as we read stories about Paul and Silas, we read about heroes in church history, as you look at other people around you and think, well, well obviously they're going to share the gospel. Obviously, you know, they're wired to do this. If you, feel, if you struggle with feelings of inadequacy and think, I could never do that, let that story give you courage. Paul and Silas may have shared the gospel better than we do. John might share the gospel better than we do, but he does not preach a better gospel. You have that same gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the same story of God become man, living a perfect life, dying the death that we deserve, granting us life in him through faith by grace alone. And you can share that with others. And it's a glorious calling. Can we do that, church? Can we ask God to give us faith, to strengthen us, to help us toward this end for his glory. What a wonderful calling. What a glorious gospel. What a mighty God we serve. Let's pray. Well, Father, we come... We come to the end of a text like this. We simply say glory. Glory to your name, Father. Glory to you. <laughs> Sorry. For we see you working for the sake of your name in the world all around us. Father, help us. We, we confess as we did at the beginning. We need you and we love you. We pray that you would stir our affections for you, that you would fill us full of faith, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to live out who you have called us to be as your ambassadors to proclaim this glorious grace. Father, help us to have concrete conviction that there is no one you cannot save. The gospel can save anyone. It did so for Lydia. It did so for this demon-possessed, fortune-telling slave girl. It did so for this angry, bitter, secular soldier. It did so for me. So, Father, help us, Lord, with that conviction to share with the greatest joy and passion and faith. And please bless our efforts. For the glory of your name, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we do each week, um, our, some, our community group leaders um, will be down at the front, and their wives. Uh, I'll be down. If there's any way that we can pray for you, anything at all. If you're just struggling, I, I know there's a lot of sickness going around our church right now. So if that's you this morning or a family member, uh, we'd love to pray for you. If responding to this message, if you think, yeah, that's me, I'm, I'm timid, I am inadequate, I'm introverted, I, I just don't know what to do with that, come forward, we'd love to pray for you. We're going to end our time the way we began, with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You're dismissed in the grace of Christ. If we're not praying for you, hope you have a wonderful week. You're dismissed. <laughs>